The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lori Fox. I have with me Rob Gizani, who is going to talk to us about communications today. You are all in listen-only mode. Um, there are 19 of you on the, on the uh, webinar currently. Rob is going to take questions throughout his presentation. I will be moderating for him. So you can enter your question in the question box or you can chat in the chat window. I'm keeping an eye on both of them. Um, just to be sure our technology is working properly, if everyone would tell me hello in either the question or the chat window. There's Alan. Good. Okay. Looks like things are going pretty good. All right. Well, I'm happy to have everyone here today, especially Rob. Um, I missed Rob's presentation um, last fall, but I heard from a lot of my colleagues that it was a fantastic presentation. It was one where people actually talked quite a bit on Twitter about some of the advice he gave. Um, we um, have had a busy summer so far here at my college where we've had a couple of emergencies where we've had to do some communications. Um, and during each one, I thought, man, I wish Rob was sitting here with me or I had already seen his presentation. So I'm hoping that we all get some great takeaways from Rob's webinar this afternoon. I have just a little bit of SIGUX news that I like to share with you. Um, we have some more webinars scheduled coming up. Um, there's one at the end of June on identifying IT core competencies. In July, we'll be talking about enhancing the performance of cross-functional teams. We just scheduled our August webinar, which is going to be August 16th, and that will be by um, Bethlyn Nolan, who is going to talk with us about creating a um, poster which um, is going to be good whether you are presenting at SIGUX in a poster or ever planning to present in the future. Um, and then September, we'll be hearing from the SIGUX 2018 team with our um, First Timers webinar, which we call it our First Timers webinar, but even if you've come to SIGUX before, it's always a great idea to connect together on the webinar to hear about things that are planned for the fall conference. We are currently accepting nominations for our SIGUX awards. The URL is up on your screen um, to where you can nominate people that, that you admire or that you've worked with and have done um, work for SIGUX. You also have just a few more days to submit your work to the SIGUX Communication Awards. These awards um, recognize excellence in information technology communications, which is a perfect tie-in today. So if you are involved in um, communication for your, your department, I encourage you to submit your work to these awards. Um, I have submitted uh, for the last three or four years some of our projects, and although we've never won, I still feel like a winner because you get feedback on your project. Um, and the feedback is from last year's winners. And they offer great suggestions and advice about your work. So again, just a few more days to submit for the communication awards. The conference is coming up. Um, I just ordered my tickets to spend a day at Disney before the conference starts. Um, we're just about 130 days from the start of the conference. Pretty excited to go to Orlando and hope to see all of you there. The keynote speakers have been announced. Um, Jeffrey Salingo is going to talk about uh, life after college. And Geraldine Fitzpatrick is one of our ACM Distinguished um, speakers, and we're delighted to have her at the conference as well. There are four pre-conference seminars. Um, the first one that's actually being led by the Disney Institute is the Business Behind the Magic, where you have an opportunity to hear directly from Disney about their award-winning customer service, and you're going to be on a behind-the-scenes tour of some of the Disney parks which I've never been on, um, but that sounds like a great opportunity. 
and then three other pre-conference seminars. The details about all of them are available on the SIGUX conference website. I encourage you to make your hotel reservations if you are planning to join us. We do not get to sleep at the Hollywood Hotel, unfortunately, um, but we do have great service of the Disney Magical Express. Um, my family travels to Disney just about every other year, and one of the things I love about the Magical Express is that you do not have to wait for your luggage. They deliver it to your hotel room. That's magical. I just think that that's wonderful. We also, um, as hotel guests, are able to use the bus service to get around Disney. Um, there is parking at the hotel, and you may have heard that um, Disney is changing their pricing structure for parking at the hotel. Um, we do have free parking for our hotel, and you can order uh, discount Disney Park tickets. I bought actually tickets for two parks for two days. You get a free um, ticket to a water park, and that was $200. So that's a pretty nice bargain. Registration is open. Um, I always think of the Little Einsteins theme song when I see this rocket. It's a lot of fun. Um, but anyway, you can go ahead and register now. Early registration ends at the beginning of September. Uh, joining SIGUX, uh, the, the biggest benefit of joining SIGUX is, of course, the conference discount. You also get a very big pre-conference seminar discount, access to the digital library, and uh, participation in the mentoring program. Here are all the different ways to stay in touch with SIGUX, although I assume if you are on this um, webinar, you heard about the webinar uh, from one of those areas, so you're already in touch with us, and that's a good thing. I'm now going to turn the controls over to Rob. All right. Okay, so Rob, I'm going to mute myself also. Um, but as people ask questions or if you want to solicit questions or participation at all, um, I'm paying attention and I will hop right back on. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lori, and uh, for sharing all that information. Um, welcome to all of you. I, it's kind of weird. This is actually my first uh, webinar, so I can't like really see anybody, but I, I trust that you're out there. Uh, what I'll be sharing with you today is uh, my presentation that I presented at Seattle last fall at the SIGUX conference. Um, I updated a few things just because, you know, it's it's been six months. And uh, again, this is a uh, very excited to bring this to you because this is mostly uh, a lot of non-technical things. Um, and uh, honestly, I don't have any uh, professional background in communications. This is really kind of things... I've just sort of learned over time. And uh, so I guess we'll just jump right into this. And uh, you're probably wondering who I am. I mean, you know my name. Um, but now you know a little bit of what I look like. And uh, I'm just going to give you a little of my background here. Um, I was born and raised in the state of New Jersey. And I am familiar with all the New Jersey jokes. Uh, and there are actually some pretty good ones and justified in many cases. But uh, that's my home. I went, left New Jersey and when I went to uh, Penn State as an undergrad. And uh, there I went on a Navy ROTC scholarship. So following my, uh, my time at Penn State, I served uh, four years in the Navy. Uh, decided that wasn't for me. Um, got out of the Navy and actually returned to my alma mater um, and worked in technology support for the College of Ag Sciences there. And after about eight years, uh, I had an opportunity to come to Bucknell University. And that was almost 17 years ago and where I am today. So just a little bit about Bucknell, just to give you a context of uh, you know where I am in my environment. Um, if you've never heard of Bucknell, um, we are the Bucknell bison, uh, hence the clever use of the word herd. Uh, Bucknell, we're basically a uh, liberal arts institution, um, actually rather large for a university that's uh, designated as a liberal arts students with about 3,500 undergraduate students. Um, we have three colleges. Um, we are fairly selective and uh, fairly expensive, um, but that's pretty much who we are. 
and uh, we did participate in uh, Division One athletics. So we're a lot of times we describe ourselves as kind of too big to be small, but too small to be big. And uh, that's who we are at Bucknell. A little bit about the organization I work for at Bucknell. Uh, we are referred to as a library and information technology. Um, we are a merged organization. Uh, the library side and the technology side merged back in 1997. Um, so combined, we uh, comprise of about 85 uh, different staff members uh, spread across 12 different work groups. Um, so that's pretty much me. And uh, so let's move on to uh, basically on a foundational level, defining what is good communication. And uh, again, this isn't anything I looked up or defined or looked up at Webster's Dictionary, uh, but these are things that I it kind of jump out at me when I think about what good communication is. Um, first and foremost, it's clear and it's concise. Um, nobody you know, wants to have to struggle to understand what they're reading or what you're telling them. Um, or just sort of all this sort of flamboyant stuff that surrounds your message, um, especially in today's world where we're bombarded with so many different uh, ways of communication, you know, with our smartphones and things like that. Um, people value something that's clear, concise, and easy to understand. Um, the other aspect of good communication, I feel, is it being relevant and being meaningful. Um, you know, people, again, get so many different messages in their daily, daily lives, but really what they value is what's relevant and meaningful to them and their situation. Um, timeliness is key. The, uh, basically, you know, you've heard the expression, timing is everything. Um, getting the communication when you need it is critical. You don't want, for example, uh, yesterday's weather report today. Uh, that's not really useful. So again, timeliness is key. Um, another part of communication, uh, I feel, is, is also respect. Um, I think uh, a lot of what we do in IT and technology when we communicate to our end users and clients, sometimes I, I think we, uh, we sometimes make people feel less intelligent than they really are because sometimes we speak a language that most people don't understand. And so when you say, oh, you just have to do this, you know, like, you know, it's, it's so easy. You, sometimes by doing that, you, you inadvertently and quite unintentionally may sort of belittle someone. So it's always important to make sure that you're, you're being respectful. And finally, one thing that I uh, feel is important is establishing a rapport with, with your clientele. Um, for us, you know, it, our clientele is, is relatively, uh, constant and unchanging. And we're here at a college campus, as, as many of you are. Um, so they get to kind of know who you are, and you get to kind of know who they are. And uh, getting back to the few previous slides I showed you, that was actually something maybe um, subconsciously I did with this group. I shared with you um, a lot of my backgrounds personally. I shared with you my professional background and where I work today. So by doing that, you know a little bit about me, you know a little bit about where I work and my environment. So I think uh, that helps you to connect and understand with the message that I'm delivering to you right now. All right, so let's get into the, the meat of the presentation here. Um, these are the things we think about before we communicate. Um, the first thing we do here at Bucknell is we think about what, what we're doing. And by that, I mean, we, we have 12 different work groups um, doing different things. Not all of them are technology, um, but in the technology realm, we are very careful to take a look at um, different things that we're doing and making sure internally we're on board with each other and know what's happening before we start communicating externally. Um, I don't know about you, but some of my most frustrating communication experiences actually haven't been with the campus. It's been with some of my own coworkers and work groups. Okay, the other thing we, we explain, and I'll dive into this a little bit deeper here, uh, what clients need to know. Okay, just uh, we're doing a lot of things, but in the end, what does your audience really need to know? Um, which clients need to know? Um, there's things that we do that doesn't necessarily affect the entire campus. 
Um, so when possible, you've got to kind of figure out what clients actually need to know the information. Um, fourth and very important thing is how do we tell them? Okay, obviously there's different ways of communicating things and depending on your constituencies, um, some methods work better than others. Um, when do we tell them? That kind of gets into the timing thing. And finally, how do we make it memorable? And uh, that's kind of how I wrap up with the presentation with, uh, with some specific examples that we've used in the past. All right, so kind of diving in what we're doing, and this I kind of dove into a little bit earlier. Um, internally, we connect and collaborate. We have cross work group meetings, um, things like that, just to make sure that we're understanding what everybody is doing. So if our uh, systems integration team is doing something, uh, or a network team is doing something with wireless or something, we, we need to understand their projects, what they're doing, and how they're going to affect the campus. Um, so that's, again, that's the biggest thing. And, and believe me, some of our more, most fra more frustrating things have occurred because we haven't talked to each other. Um, externally, uh, here at Bucknell, we, we have a couple things in place where we try to stay connected with our clients. Um, we, we have what we refer to as a technology liaison program. And what happens is all of us in tech support, where I work, uh, have departments that we're a liaison to. So anyone on campus with a technical problem can call our general helpline and get help with a printing issue or a network issue or a software issue. Um, but what we try to do is, is I, I have about 13 or 14 different departments that, that I kind of try to get to know on a more personal level, if you want to call it that. I uh, sort of dive into understanding their work a little bit more so I can actually maybe offer some suggestions and, and kind of almost walk a mile in their shoes. And I think uh, that goes a long way when you have that working relationship on a professional level. Um, so for example, athletics is one of my departments and it's, it's by far my largest department. Um, but I spent a lot of time down there. Um, I've, I've been a coach myself and an athlete, so I, I kind of understand some of the things that they go through and, and their challenges. And again, I think uh, just them knowing my background and, and just being around, you know, walking around, you know, once or twice a week um, really kind of goes a long way when, uh, when we need to deal with more difficult issues. Uh, the other thing we do um, on a more campus-wide level, and we do this on the library side and the technology side, is uh, we, we have standing advisory groups. We have a faculty advisory group for technology. We have a staff advisory group. Um, and we also have focus groups of students um, from varying different uh, cons constituencies um, that, you know, you, you bring them in. And there's all kinds of, you could almost do a presentation just on this itself where we uh, you know, offer them free pizza or something, or, you know, had to fill out a questionnaire or you do things. And uh, depending on what we're doing and what kind of information we're looking to gather, um, we'll pull together focus groups to do that. Okay, so after, so that's the kind of all the groundwork that we do, even before we communicate anything. Um, then when it comes time to know what we need to do, um, we have to ask, you know, what clients need to know. And for that, if we have a particular project or something we feel is gonna affect some type of service, um, we, we need to kind of first ask ourselves, how relevant is it? Uh, like if we're gonna be doing something that isn't gonna be noticed by anyone and there's not gonna be any change in any kind of user interface or a change in service, we may choose just to not even communicate it at all. Um, now, if there is something that we're doing that's actually gonna be a benefit um, of course, that's that's kind of an opportunity for some good PR. So if, if we're doing something that's going to make something faster or easier or more accessible, um, you know, that's that's an opportunity to kind of maybe you know blow our own horn a little bit and just say, hey, you know, these changes, even though it's a minor inconvenience, these are the good things you're going to see from it. Um, obviously, the other thing is uh, sometimes it is an inconvenience. You know, you just have to take a step back to take two steps forward. And uh, whether it's real or a perceived thing, uh, that's, that's something that you also have to, to discuss and figure out if what they specifically need to know and how it's going to affect them and their world. Um, because let's face it, that's pretty much what we all care about is how is it going to affect me? Um, and the other part of this 
is you know setting priorities because honestly where i am sort of in the intersection of, of communication for my department yeah you know, everybody's thing is important and everybody wants an email and you know something communicated every single day and we got to remind people this 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 and if everything's important then nothing is important and that's a very real thing that is very easy to to slip into and that's that's kind of almost probably one of the more tougher things that I do is is helping people determine or telling people, okay, understand this is important. This is what we're going to do, and I think this is enough in terms of how much we communicate this particular initiative. Okay, moving on to number three, uh, which clients need to know, and uh, this is actually something we spend a good deal of time uh, working through. Um, we could easily just sort of blanket email the campus about stuff, um, whether it affects them or not. So if we're making some change on the Windows side that's going to affect everybody using Windows 10, uh, we could. It would be very easy just to blast, you know, the campus. You know, maybe narrow it down to faculty and staff. Even you know, there's Mac users in there and stuff that is totally not relevant to. And well, they, you know, they'll know they're not using a Windows machine, so they'll know to dismiss it. Um, but that becomes a problem because now you're making them read your messages and figure out, is this applying to me? Is this something I need to worry about? And, and quite honestly, most people don't have the time to just kind of read through a message and figure out if it applies to them. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the first problem. The, the bigger problem that will eventually happen is people will just start to tune you out. So when you send messages, it's like, oh my gosh, it's another message from IT. Um, yeah, the last three didn't pertain to me, so I'm not even going to read this one. And, and that one, you know, most more than likely, is the one that has something that has to do with them or affects their situation. Um, so what we do often here is target the communication. So if we, if we need to communicate something, for example, to Windows users, um, I'll have our Win admin actually generate a list of all of our faculty and staff that have Windows computers. And I will target them with that communication. We'll do it for the Mac side. We'll do it for things like if people are nearing a particular quota um, on our, or legacy, we have a file storage system here and uh, that's on campus. And if they're approaching a quota, rather than, you know, blast everybody saying, hey, you know, make sure you stay under your quota, you know, we'll target the specific users that are getting near the quota because this is that, this is this something that's going to affect them specifically. And they're the ones we're targeting because they're, they've filled their quota to 90% or something like that. So again, we'll target it. Okay, the fourth thing, how do we tell them? Um, and that's, that also is something that uh, we'll take time to think about. Um, every campus has their own campus culture, campus climate, you know, things that people connect with, and uh, it's probably different for all of us. Um, here at Bucknell, email is still kind of the predominant way that we and other, other constituents communicate. Um, so email is a big thing. We are pretty restricted in email as far as who can send to large lists. Uh, for example, there's probably only about 14 people that can send an email to the campus um, from the president on down. Um, so that's very restricted. Um, we have a bunch of different sublists, as I'm sure you do too. But again, those are very restricted. So just a, a random faculty member who's having a talk over lunchtime can't blast the campus with an email advertising it. Um, what we do with that is we have something that's referred to as a message center. Um, basically, it's it's something that lives in our portal. It's uh, it has all different categories, ranging from academic. Um, athletics, uh, religious, uh, community, and uh, you can post your message to in different categories there. Um, and you can look at them real time as they're posted or uh, every day you get a digest of everything that was posted. So in a single email, you can kind of skim down everything that was posted the day before to see if the stuff is relevant to you. Um, truthfully, one of the bigger things there is we have a uh, sort of a personal classified section of the message center where people will sell uh, you know an old rocking chair or they're looking for a room to rent or they have 
an apartment to rent or somebody has kittens they want to give away. Um, that's actually a very, very, uh, very, very popular use of the message center. Not the only use, but it's, and again, it is at the very bottom. So you really got to scroll down to see that stuff. Um, but it is pretty heavily used. And quite honestly, that stuff draws people to the message center to read the stuff that we, you know, the, the relevant Bucknell related stuff. Um, so it, it's kind of a win-win there. Uh, we also, in that portal, we have a specific window that's just outages and alerts where it's like you kind of you look at everything. It's kind of like a traffic light. You know, if everything's green, everything's good. If you see something yellow, you know, it's it's just a really easy, quick indicator to figure out, OK, you know, this is something's up with this or why is uh, why is my network slow? And if you see the network thing is yellow, it's like, oh, OK, you know, there's something going on. Um, of course, network things are always kind of the funny things, though, aren't they? Because, you know, if the network's down, you're not getting to any of this stuff. Um, but that is what it is. And, and luckily, our, our network is, is, is pretty good uptime. Um, uh, secondarily, we also have some other ways that we communicate. Uh, we have a blog. We have a Twitter thing. We have a Facebook page. Um, quite honestly, I don't think those are really heavily used at all. It's not like we have a lot of followers or anything on these other methods, but it is another way to communicate and the people that are following it, well, you know, then good for them. We'll, we'll continue to post stuff there as well. Uh, big lesson in here, this though, is, is whatever it is you do, um, be consistent in what you do. Um, so if, if there's some sort of event or project or outage, communicate it in the same way every time. Um, so you know, send an email out. Mo most things, especially important things, we'll put, we'll send an email out. We'll post it in the message center. And uh, oh, and by the way, in the message center, we can also categorize like students, faculty, staff. So you can actually sort of narrow down your audience in a, in a broad sense, but at least you can do something to to narrow it down. Um, but whatever it is, do it the same way every time, so people know what to expect and know where to look to find the information. Okay, number five, when do we tell them? And this gets back to the timing thing I've referred to a couple times. You know, timing is everything. Um, if we're going to be, uh, if our network uh, team, you know, this summer, and we, we do probably like you all, we do a lot of projects in the summer, you know, things that we just can't get done during the, uh, the normal academic semester. Uh, we we do a lot of big stuff. So we might take a router down, for instance, in networking, uh, and we might be, you know, the campus might have an internet interruption, and it's usually at some crazy hour of the morning, like you know, midnight to 4 a.m. or something like that. Uh, yeah, if that's happening on June 30th, and we tell them today, it's probably going to be forgotten, or they're going to see it's June 30th, and they're going to dismiss it. And it's it's just way too much notice. Uh, however, if we advertise on June 29th that it's happening on June 30th, that can be a problem as well, because um, not enough notice could create an inconvenience. And uh, oftentimes, we we try to hit like a sweet spot. Like for example, for something say say the entire campus was going to be without internet for a period of time, that is probably something because it affects a bunch of things and potentially a lot of people we uh we advertise those things you know at least a week in advance if not you know probably a week to 10 days in advance because sometimes someone will raise their hand and say hey wait a minute you know there's there's a problem because we have a particular event that maybe we weren't aware of um but again we don't really have a uh, a formula per se it's really just sort of uh what the what the scale of the project or interruption will be and that kind of helps us judge when we should communicate it um, you know something smaller like hey we're going to have moodle down for an hour from 7 to 8 a.m on a saturday uh, that might be something that we wouldn't advertise until the previous wednesday um, but again it, it, it's one of those things and, and again that kind of thing comes from experience as well just kind of knowing, you know, the impact, how many people are affected, time of year, and we just kind of take all those things into account to try to kind of hit that sweet spot in terms of timing. Um, one thing we've also done, and because uh, there's things that we communicate pretty much every year right around the same time, and uh, just things, you know, with the start of the semester things, you know, holiday things, going to the holiday break, uh, you know, in terms of turning things off, like there's just certain communications we do about the same time every year. And uh, we have basically just a communications calendar. You know, it's sort of like a, 
just a reminder, a tickler file kind of thing that that when uh, just reminds us, hey, we should communicate this, we should communicate this at this time. Um, and again, that helps too, you know, because we don't have to like reinvent the wheel. We just are prompted to do stuff, you know, when we need to do it. And uh, it just helps, you know, and having to keep track of it. And the other thing too is getting back to my other slide, it's, it's consistent and people kind of expect it. And oh, okay, almost forgot about this point. Um, obviously, and I alluded to this earlier, we want to resist that temptation to over communicate. And uh, again, easy trap to fall into, but there is a sweet spot. You know, like some people say over communication, oh, it's better over communicate than under communicate. And that is true to an extent. Uh, again, you don't want to get in a situation where when you're, you're over communicate, people will just start to tune you out. I mean, that is just what happens. And quite honestly, we see it with our students all the time. Okay, how do we make it memorable? This is, this is actually uh, my favorite part. Uh, this is where um, I, I kind of brought something to the table that hadn't previously been done when, uh, before I got here. And quite honestly, I think I was just in a, in a punchy mood uh, when we, we started doing this and it just kind of took off. Uh, let's face it, if, if you get an email or a message or whatever, it's, it's pretty much dry and informal, people are going to skim read it, um, especially in a university setting. We, there, there's enough textbooks and formal policies and things like that. Like, people are just tired of just reading, you know, this well-written English that uses big words and sounds good. And it's just, and, and people just skim read it, which is, Actually, why phishing scams are so uh, so so successful because people are just skim reading things that they're they're getting and they're like, oh, okay, whatever, you just need my password, fine, and uh, they're just not looking at the fact that it came from you know someone they don't know or an address that's not part of the university or why are you asking for my password? Uh, um, so basically, when we uh, write our messages, uh, we write them to be they're always as brief as they possibly can be. Um, they're easy to read, they're easy to understand, and they're unconventional. And I'll show you some examples of that coming up here. Um, but one thing, and and I just one thing, and I just sent out a mess, a couple of messages today. Uh, as far as keeping them brief, uh, and this is actually a question I got at the conference. We basically include links to things wherever possible. And uh, for example, we have a knowledge base that we have in terms of, you know, how to access, you know, the, how do you install the VPN, um, how to access resources from off campus. We have all kinds of what we refer to as knowledge based articles that we put all that type of information in. So if we have to reference it, you just put the link in the email and they can just go right to it. And it really shortens up the email. And the other nice thing about that is if something changes with a particular procedure or a policy, you can just change the web page and that email is still relevant because that link will go to the updated information on the web page. Um, so that's one thing that I didn't specifically put in here, but if you can put stuff up on a website somewhere that's a policy or something that doesn't change much, it's much easier to just update a web page than it is to send out another email saying that something changed. Okay, so what I'm going to do here, and, and I apologize, there's going to be a lot of words on the screen coming up. Uh, these are some specific examples that we've done in terms of making things memorable and, and sort of wrapping up um, all those things that I just discussed. What you're going to see here, and I'll put it up here so you get a chance to start reading it, um, this is something our chief security officer wanted me to send to the campus. Uh, this is Lori popping in to say, I stopped reading after the second line. That's too many words. <laughs> hey, Rob, while people are reading and it this, was... um, Becky yeah. asked um, if you would be willing to share your communication calendar. I don't know if you offer it as an example um, or if anyone else had communication calendars they could share as well. Do you... Um, offer a glimpse into that at the end of your presentation? Sure. Okay, thanks. You can do that. Uh-huh. I'll be quiet now. No problem at all. I'm glad to know people are listening. Um, so basically, and again, this was literally written 
I'm not kidding. Like this was all one big paragraph and it was given to me just the way you're reading it now. And so I asked him and, and he's relatively new. And I asked him, I said, hey, would you mind if I rewrote this a little bit just to make it a little bit more clear to the campus? And, and honestly, to his credit, he said, sure. And uh, and that honestly, yeah, I kind of admire him for that because, you know, oftentimes people, you know, would kind of be offended or whatever. But I, I think he recognized the value in, you know, th this is his speak. This is the world he lives in. And, and that's fine. But we have to think about our audience, not the world we're living in. So next is the translated version of what you just read. Now there is more to this message. I, you know, I just sort of cut it off because I could include the whole thing. But uh, but when when rewriting this, the the first thing I did is just kind of dumb it down, um, in a sense that there was a lot of great technical information in the first one, but that wasn't really something that's relevant to our audience. Um, what was important was explaining what it did, why it was of value to them. And uh, and I also included smaller paragraphs, so it was easier to kind of read it in bits and chunks rather than this big block of text. Okay, so I'll move on here. Um, our second example, and this is where, again, this is where uh, we use a fair amount of creativity um, and uh, just to kind of make it memorable because sometimes people will, uh, again, you know, the dry and boring stuff, people are like, oh, whatever. But so people kind of enjoy a change of pace, especially when they're thinking they're going to get something serious. Um, so this one uh, is something that we, uh, we needed to communicate about ransomware. And this was basically just the, uh, the introduction to the email, um, just to kind of draw people in. It was kind of that little like nugget that's like, oh, that's kind of clever. And it was obviously right around the 4th of July, uh, July 5th, exactly. And uh, so, yeah, so we just kind of kept it relevant to uh, current events. Okay, we have another example here. Um, this one was for our uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And this was, uh, this is actually the entire email that we sent to campus. And uh, this was, again, the entire email. We, uh, we actually chose sort of the uh, what's the worst that can happen uh, as a theme for the, for the month. And so it was like a little tagline. And uh, in the message center, which again, we, we referred people to each, each day in the message center, we would kind of put like these little nuggets about, you know, cybersecurity awareness. And, you know, hey, you know, there's, what's the worst could happen if this, and uh, so you, you kind of make people aware of it. It was kind of this little tagline thing. Um, you know, it was a little bit creative, so people kind of paid attention to it. Um, we didn't email them every single day, um, but it was in the message center every single day. And as I mentioned earlier, they uh, they received a digest every day. And, and if people read it, they read it. And if they didn't, they didn't. Um, but it was kind of this nice, you know, sort of in between rather than giving them an individual email about things every day. Okay. Um, this one, here's another example of creativity. And this one is literally one I wrote uh, today and sent out to our incoming class of 2022. Rob, we have a question um, about how you handle URLs. When you put in links, do you put in the full URL in line with the text or at the bottom, 
or do you use hidden links like in an HTML message? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the way I do it, and you know, this is might be a little bit of a throwback, but uh, we include it right in the middle of the message. So basically, it's like you know, if you need, uh, if you're wondering how to access network space from off campus, you know, please visit. And then I'll have a colon, and then I'll go to the next line, and I'll put the whole URL there. And it, it is a link, um, but I had done that before because it used to be important, like for some people, to just copy and paste the link. Right. Right. Um, and so you had the whole URL there in case it didn't show up as a link. Um, I'm honestly not a big fan of just like, you know, if you want to, you know, if you want more information about this, click here. And then you have like sort of the here underlined and it and it, the word here is the hyperlink because I, I just feel like there's too many phishing messages out there that do that. And so that's why I just plainly put the URL right out there. That's a great point. Um, I did some phishing education recently that actually said the same thing. Um, because people don't take the time to mouse over and look at the link. Exactly. And so there, if the link's there, it's it's very obvious to see that, especially, you know, in our knowledge base or whatever, if it's on our website, it's very obvious to see that it is a mm -hmm. Bucknell URL. And uh, so that's just, just kind of the way we, we've kept doing it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, and here's my, uh, I think my last example. Uh, this was actually an interesting one uh, where we actually screwed up. Uh, it was, and, and these are sometimes the hardest communications to write. The, uh, we basically accidentally sent out an email to all of our seniors uh, saying that the uh, that their accounts were going away as a as of april 15th it was an automated message that i i don't know how it got generated we did um, that once <laughs> i'm so it's oh, did you? I, well i'm sitting here laughing like crazy because we did that once yeah well and you can imagine you know so you receive this in the beginning of april and you're like okay it's and this is you know post spring break you know you, you all know it's yeah, the semester gets kind of crazy after spring break. You know, it's kind of this rush for the finish line. Um, so you can imagine students getting this email, and, and they don't know every student got it, and every and it right. was a mistake. So they're like, "Oh wait, you know, it's you know, it's it's a mistake, you know." And so we're getting all these phone calls. Um, so we kind of had to scramble, and uh, and it was like, "Oh yeah, this is kind of ugly." But yeah, you know, I, I tried to, you know, I mean, it was you know, not something we wanted to scare people about, you know, but it was, you know, something I, I had a little fun with writing it and just say, hey, we all make mistakes. And uh, this was one that we made and we're sorry. <laughs> right. Um, and not, don't worry. <laughs> oh my goodness. The questions are coming in like crazy here. So Rob, let's take a few minutes and address these. Um, how do you sure. respond to those who don't want links at all in their emails because of the risk of phishing? Um, this person's colleagues would prefer that she actually type out the instructions on how to get to a site instead of using a link. That's hyper vigilant. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and honestly, no, it, that's actually come up before. And you know, kind of going back to what I said earlier, it, it it was a little bit of a sell, and and I think the putting the whole hyperlink in there was the compromise. Uh, again. To you, the whole thing is I really try any email I send out, I really keep to a page or less. Like if it goes on to like another page or even another screen, you, you're starting to really lose people. And uh, and if something in those instructions does change, like, oh, OK, and, and that's happened. It's like, oh, hey, this isn't working as we expected. Oh, yeah, well, we have to change that link or have to change something. Now, all of a sudden, you've got to resend the whole email again. And uh, so when you're when faced with those, those kind of things, we we kind of came to that compromise of putting the whole link in the email, and okay. rather than putting a complete set of instructions in there. Okay. Um, what does your security officer? Oh, similar question. What does your security officer have to say about using links and URLs versus educating users to be wary of clicking on them because of phishing dangers? He's he's all right with it. I mean, he um, I said he's a pretty good guy to work with. He's he's 
he understands. I mean, I think again, him being, he's only been here for about a year and a half, I guess. And, uh, He's he's okay with it. He likes the idea of having the whole URL in there. Um, again, he putting any link in any email is kind of a risky thing. But I, you know, in general, like I'm talking beyond Bucknell. But what we're referring to here is internal communications, and you know, our campus culture in terms of doing that. So they know, for instance, like I, and and I'm not sure how this ever happened, but. Like I literally send our communications out from my email account and I sign them with my name. Mm -hmm. And it, it, honestly, if I could do it over again, I, I would have made up some sort of alias or something like that um, because I get a lot of email now. Sure. But, but people people know, oh, this email's from Rob Gisani. It's, it's you know, Rob always sends stuff that's, legitimate and he also and they also note things about the style um like we've had people you know fishing things that have attempted to impersonate our president you know just like and and you can tell i mean if you know, depending on how good the english is which is always kind of a tip off sure um that they're just not the same style as the things they're accustomed of getting you know people that are accustomed to getting um so we've actually gotten pretty good at educating people Mm -hmm. and, and just people understanding that what legitimate messages are and aren't. Okay. Um, Andrea also brings up a great point um, to keep in mind screen readers for ADA. They actually recommend using click here so people do not have to hear the whole link. Mm. No, that I, actually is a good point. That is a very good point. I've never thought of that. We typically try to, um, if it's something that... Um, is kind of a deep link on our site. We use um, what we call a Go address. We have our own URL shortener, and that makes right. our URLs um, shorter. Well, and and that's actually a great point. And honestly, that's that's something I've never thought about. I mean, we have a like a disability services area office here, and uh, she never actually said anything about it. But I think. I, I might just be getting lucky because <laughs> most of our ERLs in like our knowledge base are pretty short. Like it's just bucknell.edu ask slash and then it's like a digit number. So it's not that long. There have been times, not even, not necessarily in my professional life either, but just in my personal life, I'm involved in different organizations where I'll, I'll refer to something and I'll see the URL is like two lines long. And then I will do exactly what you said. I'll, I'll use a URL shortener. Um, and, and that's just mainly because, all right, this thing's way too long. And if someone attempted to type this, they could easily get this wrong. Right. So, so I think fortunately, but that is something I'll definitely consider in the future. You know, the URLs, when we're referring to our and campus resources, they're just not that long anyway. Right. It's a very yeah. interesting debate. The one thing that we try to do in our department is to set a standard so we're all at least doing the same thing. Yes. Yes, that, that would be very important. Okay, that's all our questions so far, Rob. Okay. All right, so I'll move on. Actually, I'm almost done with my examples here. Now, I think that was my last example. Um, so basically, in the end, um, I like this quote. And it's funny, there's different people that have attributed themselves to this quote. And I had to Google for like a half hour to basically narrow it down to this guy, Carl Buhner. But, uh, but you've probably all heard this before. Um, you know, they'll forget what you said, you know, but they'll never forget how you made, you made them feel. And, uh, and I think that's really important. And, I, and I'll share a story. And this happened uh, at a, a graduation function we had here at Bucknell. And uh, it just a, almost exactly a year ago, we have like a re faculty and staff reception for the graduates and their families. And, uh, you know, it's just a social thing. You know, there's like wine and cheese and things. And, you know, you just kind of hang out. And uh, I don't know, sort of setting the stage. I don't know if you remember, it was probably a year ago in May where that big Google uh, phishing thing came up with the sharing of Google Drive documents. And uh, like a, lots of universities were exploited by it, you know, where people were sharing. Yes, I remember. Know, clicked on a link and they're sharing. 
So you probably, yeah, I mean, it, it was a big deal here because it happened like right at the beginning of finals week. Um, it looked legitimate enough. People were skim reading. People had other things doing. People were sharing stuff. We had like over 400 accounts that were compromised. And, uh, and we were, we worked, you know, we were working late that day um, to kind of seal things up. And, you know, people were panicking because they knew they had to, you know, they were, you know, they had done something wrong wrong and as if they you know had anything else to worry about in finals week and uh, I had written a note and I didn't include it in this presentation but it actually is in the white paper that I submitted with this uh, this thing I just it's too long to put here uh, but basically it was again it was a thing where we needed to communicate quickly we needed to just do it very simply you know tell people just not to panic everything's okay you know this was this was a really difficult one to even discern. So don't feel bad if you fell for it. And, and, and that's how I ended it. It was really just kind of this random, just like signing off, like, hey, don't feel bad if you fell for this. And I had a student come up to me and he said, are you Rob Gistani? And I said, yeah, I am. You know, <laughs> And he said, I just want to tell you, over my years here, I have always appreciated your emails because you always thought about who you were writing to. And it was always easy to understand. And that last email you wrote, that last line just made you know me feel that it better. And you could tell you were, you were you were talking to people. You weren't just a technology guy spouting technology information. And I just want to let you know that last line about you know not feeling bad because you fell for it um, was was very meaningful to me. And uh, now I don't know how much this particular student had to drink or whatever, but yeah, obviously it was uh, on the back of their mind. Um, yeah, in the back of their mind enough for them to approach me. I'd never met that student before and uh, you know, probably never will see him again. But again, it, it was something that really stuck with me um, as I was writing the paper, preparing for the conference in the fall. And, and it was one of those moments where it wasn't something I necessarily deliberately set out to do but it was something it was an effect that was very positive and uh you know you know again i, I don't have that happen i haven't didn't happen happen last this year so it, it may never happen again but but that's the other thing to kind of remember is is when we communicate we're, we're basically in a people business here um you know technology is our product but we're still dealing with people and i think uh, it's it's very important not to forget about that part of the job that we do is it is a people job and, and technology, you know, is a tool, you know, f for people. And it's, uh, you know, it's obviously it has its challenges, but um, just never forget the people part. And uh, it's easy to, it is easy to do. And it takes a little bit of work to do the, the kind of things we're doing here at Bucknell. But I, I think we definitely uh, were very effective and we have a very good rapport with our campus. So, we have a question from from someone who wonders, are there any suggestions if we work with and for people who don't know how to speak to people? They're not always open to suggestion. Um, that's actually a great question. Um, it, it's funny because over, it, it's not like I just walked in here and, uh, and started doing these things. And, like in the beginning, everything I wrote, I had to have, cleared by my supervisor before it went out and it wasn't because i did anything wrong at that time it was because you know it, well you know you you just can't send something to the campus without it being cleared by somebody above you and then over time you know that trust was built and they said you know you can just do this yourself um the the challenge though and, and again i i I kind of go back to like our CIO and so, like there are definitely people I work with that don't appreciate the the way the what I'm doing and the way I'm doing it because some people view it as kind of unprofessional and it's funny because I have the benefit of of being here for a period of time and and literally I was having lunch with my CIO on campus and he took me to lunch uh, long story about that but I literally had two people come up to me and say, hey, Rob, you know, hey, I, I just want to let you know I love your emails. And, and it's the unsolicited, like, 
you know, I like how could he say, okay, I, and, and literally, I don't think he, he, it is not his style. He would never send out an email like that, but he recognizes that, okay, there's people that actually respond to this like it. And uh, there was, there was actually a time and, and I'll say, cause I'm definitely not perfect. There, there was one time I sent a note out, um, well, actually twice. One that was, could be perceived as borderline like offensive, or at least a particular faculty member thought it was offensive. So my CIO thought you should mm. tell me about it. And uh, yeah, it was, and honestly, <clears throat> it was kind of a reach. It was more of a, you know, there's, we, we had just gotten a phishing message from uh, somewhere in India or something like that. Like it was plain that it came from India from the address. Mm. And we, it was kind of, we always use those, we try to use those things, especially things that are widespread as a teachable moment. And so we'll actually cite the phishing email everybody got and explain to them, here's the things that you should be looking for. And one of the things is, okay, this address is actually not from Bucknell, it's from India. And I said, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of nice people in India, but this person wasn't one of them. And, uh, and I guess somebody perceived that as- Oh my goodness, as, you know, somebody sensitive. Yeah, I, yeah, but you do have to be aware. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I, that's why I throw that in there because yeah, the, the, I definitely walk up to a line and, and I come very close to crossing it at times, um, especially in, in today's society where we were just very sensitive about a lot of things and, and, and quite unintentionally. And obviously that was not my intention, um, but he had a faculty member come to him upset with that. I mean, it, I, I, it was what it was. Um, and then there was another thing I was asked to send out that I guess our CIO didn't know about. <laughs> So I, I just kind of sent it out. And then after that, he's like, hey, you know, not your, he didn't know about us. So he was kind of blindsided by it. And that was more of a thing where we, that was the internal communication thing that should have occurred that mm -hmm. I thought he knew and he didn't know. So at that point, he's like, hey, I want you to run things by me um, before you send them out. Not to, and he said, not, I'm not proofreading it. I just want to know what you're sending out before you actually send it out. So do so, you send out all of your department's communications, Rob? Is that part of your official job duties? Yes. Yeah, it's it's something. Now, I only do it mainly for the technology side. Mm -hmm. um, but quite honestly, there's, I mean, obviously, technology is one of those things that affects the entire campus. Um, so I even stuff that's not for my work group, they'll just have, I'll, they'll run it through me. So it affects the end user. They'll have me they'll have me communicate it. Mm -hmm. So I guess the short answer is yes, I do. Okay. Does anyone have any questions, other questions for Rob? Rob, this has been fantastic. This is fantastic. Oh, can you show us your calendar, your communication calendar real quick before we go? Oh, I don't, I don't have it on this computer. Ah, okay. It's a, uh, yeah, it's actually in an Excel spreadsheet on a different computer, but I can, uh, Whoever it is that wanted it, just e my email is up on the screen there. Just email me and say, hey, can you send me, you know, a copy? Because basically it's not it's not even that pretty to look at. It's more just kind of like notes of when to send out and when. But I can I can give you an example of it and just email it to you. Fantastic. Anything else? I don't have any other questions. I don't see any other questions. Thank you again, Rob, okay, well, for sharing this with us. Yeah, my, oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do it. You know, I was uh, actually a little bit flattered that somebody wanted to hear about my presentation again. Uh, I, I will say at Seattle, I actually gave out Hershey's Kisses for being in Pennsylvania. And you figure it would be a novelty out in Seattle. So uh, I, I'm sorry I wasn't able to do that for this one. But uh, okay. know, maybe technology someday will be able to do that. <laughs> to 3D print us some Hershey chocolate Hershey kisses. Okay, well, I hope everyone has a great afternoon and evening. We recorded this webinar. Um, so if you want to share it with a colleague or tell some people how awesome it was, it will be available next week on our website. Goodbye. Thank you.